This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is proudly brought to you by Gunner Kennels. Engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind, the G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner Kennels was started to protect your pet and it continues to be at the center of everything they do. Gunner Kennels are dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market. Man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at www.gunnerkennels.com. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 86. This week on the show, we're talking puppy pickup and the gear that you need to get your puppy home and get your training started off on the right foot. All right, welcome to this, the 85th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting, I'm your host, Josh Palm. You can check us out at hpoutdoors.com. You can also find us across all of the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're into Facebook, you can come over to our Facebook listeners group and chat with a bunch of guys over there and a few gals as well. Um, If you're new to the show, you can get all the past episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the places where you can find great quality podcast content. This week, we would like to thank off grid food company for their support of the show off grid food company's products were born from the countless nights in the wilderness that they call their second home their goal is to create the premier line of handcrafted foods from real source focused ingredients for all of your hunts scouting trips fishing trips and regular backcountry adventures all their products are developed with the rigors of the backcountry in mind and are developed and crafted to help you go the extra distance so check out off grid food company today we would also like to thank Hunt Hickory Creek, Kansas's premier deer, turkey, and waterfowl outfitter, now offering waterfowl hunts in southeast Kansas and their new lodge in central Kansas. If you want to book a hunt of a lifetime, visit their website at www.hunthickorycreek.com or follow them on Facebook and Instagram to see what they have to offer for your Kansas trip of a lifetime. We'd also like to thank Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Mount Airy Waterfowl Club in Warsaw, Virginia, and Southern Oak Kennels for their support of the show this week. Joining me this week, as he always does, is minivan Dan Harushka. I haven't said that in a while. What's up, man? Oh, that's been a, that has been a while. <laughs> yeah, Southern Oak Kennels, man. Went, uh, did a little trippy trip with Van de Camp from our group, uh, 19 hours one way. Got to stop in Nashville and hit it up with uh, Jake Terry at Gunner Kennels there for a bit, which it was extremely hot, and then ventured down and... Had a really, really good time and picked up a puppy. So it was uh it was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I wish it was longer. Um but it is what it is. Got a little yeah. dog, boo. Yeah, that's cool. Um really cool uh, you know, getting some photos from down there and uh, you got to meet some some good people down there as well and you know, it's, um, it's a big, big moment for a lot of people, you know, there's, uh, especially if you're getting into a quality, um, line of hunting dogs like Southern Oak Kennels uh, has, you know, it takes time, you know, it takes time. It takes, uh, you know, obviously resources and, you know, there's a lot that goes into getting the puppy, picking it out, getting it home safely and, uh, you know, getting yourself kind of off to the on the right foot with your training process and that adjustment period for the dog getting, getting used to everything at home. So, um, you know, this is another, another solo interview for you. This is your second, second go round. Um, yeah, I don't, I kind of like it. It was my first, well, first in-person solo that we're airing and, uh, it's a little different. It's a little different sitting there and I think it's easier, easier conversation. No doubt. Uh, to sit and talk but you know and and the funny thing is um going down there it seemed like it took quite a long time after nashville but we get down and um 
I confirmed with Barton. I was like, you know, I know other people are picking up dogs. I just want to confirm that, uh, you know, we can hang out at your at your lodge and whatnot. And he's like, yeah, and you'll be with someone else that I think you'll enjoy hanging out with. And he didn't tell me who it was. And I don't know if, if you follow Rock House Motion and their photography and videography. And, you know, they do commercials for Cabela's and all the big names, like just top of the line guys. And then um, Aaron Hitchens was there from Canada, and his mom, Maureen, was picking up a red and chase pup, who they named Stoke, and it's just a very, it was a very inspiring trip. And I think to see, you know, Aaron and his mom and Barton, like, doing things that they love to do, and immersed in it, and grinding to do better, like, be at the top of their game... It was just a really, really cool trip. I really, really enjoyed everything. And the food. Oh my goodness gracious, the food down there is something else. I don't think I could live down there just because of that. I'd be about 400 pounds, I think. <laughs> well, now that you're doing your 5.30 a.m. workouts, you probably uh, can handle it. <laughs> I yeah? might be able to handle it. <laughs> well, and then the heat on top of it. Uh, it's hot. Yeah. No. Well, cool. Let's... um. Let's go ahead and, and, and get into that, and uh, we'll play this interview that you that you did from uh, down at Southern Oak Kennels uh, with Barton Ramsey. And uh, once that's complete, we'll we'll circle back up and uh, and cover a few things. All right, we are coming to you today live from Southern Oak Kennels down here in Muggy, Mississippi. This is a little different for a for a PA boy. I think we're topping out at like eighty and still in the fifties at night, but. Uh, it is hot and sunny and nice when the clouds come over to cool it down a little bit. You have uh, a few in camp down here. We got Vandy Camp and Aaron Hitchens and his mother, Mo, who is cleaning the pool right now. <laughs> cleaning my pool. We'll clean pool for beer, she says. <laughs> yeah, so good stuff. So for those of you that have been following us, you know that I'm picking up a puppy for my father-in-law. So there are two little black lab girls that are here and they are adorable there's actually three little ones ones from a from a different different litter there but i guess eventually we're gonna have to pick out which one's going home yeah but they are they're cute and we went and saw what was the other one we saw red and red and chase red and chase litter today and that's over at brad's house and that mo is picking one up out of there she gets fourth pick mail which is cool yeah so it's cool aaron's here taking pictures just crushing it on all his equipment so i thought that we would kind of revisit the the puppy talk a little bit do's and don'ts of traveling home with these with these little critters and um even the difference between going home in a car we I, you know I, I think it ended up taking us about 19 hours to drive down here Oof. Three, three the night before, and then sixteen. But we did stop. We stopped in Nashville and and uh, up in Kentucky for some barbecue there. But you know, a little do's and don'ts maybe of of traveling in the car and flying and flying international. Maybe any other paperwork that you have to do for such a thing as that. And then I wanted to go into um, equipment for training and maybe things that you should buy before you pick up a puppy things that you buy as they age and and what yeah. you train with. Right. So let's talk about the the do's and don'ts of of puppy travel. Um you know, I think some of them are are self-explanatory. You know, you you don't want to feed the pup right before you take off on a long trip. They're going to have to go to the bathroom. Uh if you want to make sure that you stop an adequate amount of times. Some people want to hold their puppy in the vehicle, which I think is totally fine. Uh, some people want to put the pup in a secure crate. We recommend that, but we also understand, you know, the, the screaming in the beginning of, of, uh, leaving its litter mates is going to be a difficult transition. So holding on to one for a little bit at least and, and calming them down is, is not a bad thing. Um, some of the things that people I, I think don't think about is where to stop, and that's super important. 
most people are going to try to, if you're like me, accomplish everything at one exit and then get back on the road. And so you wind up letting the puppy out at a truck stop like a Loves or a Flying J. And the problem with that is everyone lets their dogs out there. And so these dogs, although they may not be exhibiting any symptoms, could be carrying all sorts of bacteria, diseases. You know, the most common would be Giardia and Coccidia. And then the worst of all would be Parvo. And so if you're letting your pup run around where all these dogs have gone to the bathroom, that's how all this is, is transmitted. Um, or if they you know, step in a puddle where these dogs have been going to the bathroom, that sort of stuff can be quite dangerous for a young pup because they've, <coughs> excuse me, at this point, they've only had one, two at the most rounds of vaccinations. And um, while that's enough to protect on some levels, it's probably not going to be enough with direct contact with Parvo. So um, you're going to want to try to find somewhere where people don't let their dogs out. I try to find a church if it's not a Sunday or a Wednesday or a bank, you know, after hours or on the weekend, uh, a restaurant that's not a commonly like not a Cracker Barrel where everybody stops, but <laughs> somewhere local, somewhere where people aren't going to be or just um, just see a, a open lot somewhere. That's not a posted lot, you know, it's a public place uh, just to let the pup run around. And, and typically they're not going to run off. You don't really need a leash if you're letting them out at places like that because they're going to be kind of glued to you. It's, it's a whole new world. And even though they want to explore, I, I let a group out in the dark at a closed medical facility and they had flown across from England to Atlanta. And I was on the way home with them the other day and I let them out and they were just running around and they all went down a hill into a hillside of kudzu and just Jeez. disappeared so i was like oh boy here we go so anyway i <laughs> just started calling for them and all of them just come flying right back out of it because you know for a puppy it's like oh where are we yeah where's my guy so uh don't stop at the at the high traffic areas you know find somewhere off the beaten path for your pup uh and then give it water in the car if you can 10 to 20 minutes before you know you're going to stop because they're going to have to go pee after they have water. So mm. go ahead and give it water, then plan your stop. Stop, wait till it goes to the bathroom, and then back on the road. So do you when you stop, do you usually you'll run them a little bit too, or are you just trying to make sure that they go potty and then get back on the way? Yeah, puppies will generally sleep, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day. And so what I'm wanting to do is you know, they'll follow you around like a little duckling. So I like to get out and just take off sprinting. <laughs> And then when they catch me, turn around, sprint the other way yeah. and just try to run them for, it doesn't take a lot of time, you know, five or six minutes of intense running. Usually that'll do two things. It'll cause them to be tired again. They'll use up all their energy. And number two, when they run like that, um, they'll have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think too, when, you know, we were going and checking out the, the red puppies over there and, you know, we went down and checked out a little duck hole. And that's one thing that I never really thought of if you do stop and, just thinking, especially down here in the south where you have a lot more poisonous snakes and stuff like that, like, I guess you kind of watch out for ditches or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, make sure that they're in a yard and, um, yeah, just things that I guess I, I really never thought about, never worried about before. But Yeah, there's some things that people overlook when it comes to taking puppies home that can be detrimental you know yeah. uh, traveling or meeting at your new house with a dog that already exists as part of the family you know be very careful introducing them particularly when it's feeding time so we've sent a dog home before and and the guy let the dog out with his his adult labrador who was a kind labrador and that one was eating its dinner and the young pup you know has no clue not to go eat the food right dives in the food and and what resulted was fatal for the puppy Ooh. so brand new pup Christmas gift for his twin girls and didn't work out. So you want to avoid anything like that. A place where the pup could fall into water and not get out um, right. or just fall into water in general. What you're really trying to do is ensure that the puppy's first exposure to everything is positive. So you don't want a pup's first exposure to new dogs to be getting growled and snapped at yeah. or to children. You know, I tell my kids don't run at new pups. You know, they want the first exposure to children outside of where the pup was raised to be a positive experience. So, um, yeah, and that was, you know, we got in late last night and actually met you at a restaurant, had a great meal, 
Is that Kermit's Outlaw Yeah, outlaw Kermit's Outlaw Kitchen. Shout oh, out. My. If you're ever around Tupelo, you definitely need Holy to stop moly. by KOK. That was that was wonderful. But yeah, and then you know, we got back and and uh you had a little bit to do with the dogs and fed them and we we were holding the puppies and you're like, make sure that you hold those puppies and you know, you that just comes from experience that if they do get in with those male dogs then you're Yeah and that could cause some issues. Yeah, so. and I have sweet dogs. You know, I don't we don't every dog here is, is at the main headquarters for the most part, they're my breeding dogs. Right. But even knowing how, you know, my dogs love everybody. They love other dogs, but I still don't trust them. You know, I had a, an eight-week-old pup slip out of a kennel, and I uh, didn't realize it. And one of my stud dogs was just running across the yard, tripped over, and broke her femur. Mm. Uh, and it healed up fine, but that's a whole deal you don't want to have to go through, right. you know. And, I just want to avoid uh, that. But the worst is just getting snapped at over food, yeah. you know. Now, would, you, would the females do that as well? Yeah, we have a we have a dog we actually raised here uh, named Rip, and we named her Rip because she got her tongue bitten. Uh, she got her tongue bitten in half by a mama dog. She walked up and was licking for food that was on the ground, and the mom snapped at her through the kennel. And the mama dog was in her kennel with her own puppies, so she was definitely in like mother mode. She right. wasn't, but just being protective and you Oof. know. Super sweet dog all the time, but right. decided at that moment, I don't want this little 12 week old puppy getting my food. And so her tongue healed up, but it looks kind of funny, you know, a little, <laughs> little nick in the yeah. side of it. Was her name Rip prior to no. that? No, <laughs> no, we hadn't named her yet. And that, that solidified <laughs> that, the name. That got it. Nailed it down. All right. So I guess I'm thinking, you know, I, I have a uh, intermediate gunner now, which is definitely too big for a, yeah. a puppy. And that's one thing you said, you know, get a small Walmart kennel, just a a cage and have that. So we're ready to go with that. What else should I have got? got yeah. I have a lead, which might be too big for her. I'm sure we'll just let her out. And Yeah, there's, there's a laundry list of things that are optional. I'll go through the ones that I highly recommend and the ones that are good and then the ones that I think we should probably avoid. Um you know, obviously the gunners are fantastic. I actually have the the small gunners for crate training, and I've talked to those guys about it. You know, for Labrador owners, it's just not feasible unless you know, we ought to create a program where we buy a handful of them and you just trade them out. Yeah. You know, like hey, yeah, we just trade them for whatever I paid. You know, you that'd be super cool. But they're going to outgrow that thing pretty quickly, right? Um, and you're going to want to move to something that's more of an intermediate size. Uh, or a medium size and then an intermediate as you grow with the pup. <laughs> so crate training, obviously in Cornerstone Gundog Academy, we, we cover the ins and outs and the do's and don'ts. You do want to feed your dog in the small crate. So you're going to need a small feeding bowl. Um, and the small feeding bowl, I actually like to get the slow feed bowl. So you can find them at like a Hollywood feed or on Amazon and they have a really weird shape to them. It almost looks like flower petals cut out in a bowl. Mm. And they had the dog has to kind of, it's like a little maze and the dog has to dig around for the food. My, my dogs typically go home very food driven. So some dogs will go home and not eat a whole lot as a puppy because they're nervous. Some dogs will go home and just be normal, just pile right into it. But eating quickly is not healthy for them. So slowing it down a little bit. Um, you'll need a water bowl. Uh, obviously, as far as a leash goes, <laughs> it's more about the safety of the dog at that point. Uh, we typically don't put any leads on our dogs until they're, I, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I have a 13 month old that I'm training that belongs to my wife. And I think she's worn a lead, a slip lead now three or four times. And it was all within the last month. Nice. So, but, but we teach heel work without a leash. So right. she's in training, but we're not going to public area. So I can definitely understand the point there, but for young puppies, um, you know, if you need a collar to identify your pup in case it get lo- gets lost, all that stuff is fine. Uh, I actually don't like to leave collars on pups in the kennel in case they go frantic. And if you have the water bowl that attaches to the door, they can get it hung in the screw on that and choke themselves. Um, and I've heard of a couple pretty serious accidents from that. So I'm I'm not, a, if you ever see pictures of Southern Oak dogs, they don't have collars on. Right. And that's why I just not a big fan of them getting hung on stuff and getting hot spots under them and all that. So I try to avoid it. Um, chew toys. That was my one of my yeah. questions. How about the you know, Man, it's a fluffy, huge fluffy. debate. So some hard fast rules. If it is a chew toy, don't play re- retrieving games with it. 
What you don't want a dog to think is the same thing that they bring back to you as a retrieve is what they can chew on. Mm. So, because later on that can translate to, well, it's my duck. So, right. I'm just going to go over here and lay down and chew it to pieces. And chomp on it. So, you know, some say chew toys lead to hard mouth. I don't really think so. I think the only time I would really want a dog to have a chew toy is at a very young age where they're very insecure and kind of bored in the kennel to give them something to do. And then when they are um, older, I would say um, four to six, four to eight months when their teeth fall out and they're growing adult teeth Um, because it helps them to relieve the pressure and the pain and all that. They want to chew and and work those teeth. And after that, I'm really not a fan at all. Don't do the raw highs or anything that can chew into a small bit and then they can choke on it. Um, Kong makes a great product. I definitely like those. The big kind of ball-shaped Kongs that you can put peanut butter in and stuff like that. Those are good if you need chew toys. I just try to limit them a good bit and uh, have a separate toy for retrieving. Actually, either use a sock or like a little cloth duck uh, for retrieving. And when you're buying the toys for retrieving, even if you want to buy like real duck makes a puppy dummy, those are fantastic. Uh, those that I think that's actually the perfect thing to canvas dummy. Uh, when you're buying something for retrieving, if you go to like a pet store and you're like, I want my puppy to have this little cute duck, make sure it doesn't squeak. Um, because if you're retrieving with squeaky toys, that encourages them to chomp. Yep. So, hey, I, I get to make that cool sound when I chomp on it. Well, I'm just going to do that the whole way back to him. <laughs> so, little things like that, just stuff to think through. Yeah, that's a, those are great points, stuff that I never thought about. And I think when Kimber was a pup, which she's nine now, but I think I bought one of the one of those uh, duck duck toys from Walmart or wherever it was. Yeah. Just stuffed animal and, you yeah. know, that's, go get it. And yeah, it works well because it doesn't hurt them. They're not afraid of it. It's not hard. I think a lot of people overdo it. People go and just go to the pet store aisle and just load up with stuff for oh, their yeah. puppy and you don't know, really need that. You need a lot more of uh, just time and socialization. So you said some of those, uh, are they bumpers, the small canvas ones you were talking yeah. about? Yeah. Is there any issues with that, with teeth that you worry about or anything like that? No. Um, they're they're soft, so they're not a problem. Another thing you can use is a, a retrieving device if you don't want to go buy the puppy dummies, knowing that you won't use them for an extremely long amount of time is the small sized um, paint rollers. Mm. So it'd be like for the little tools you use to cut trim with and yeah. that sort of thing. Um, those work very well as, as, as well. Yeah. Nice. Good. All right. So we covered, um, you know, cars, toys. How about the, the flying regular flying? I guess, you know, what do you have to go through to ship, ship puppies to people? I'm sure that a lot of, folks are one maybe unaware of it to just might scare them from what they've read online and then i guess how about traveling with with a puppy yeah and then international because mo's going she's going back to canada she's going to canada yeah right so. which is a little easier than crossing the ocean but still there are some rules there um there are really three ways to to get your puppy home you can come pick your puppy up in a vehicle which we covered or you can pick your puppy up as a um, passenger on an airplane and carry the puppy onto the airplane with you, which is what Mo is going to do on Sunday. Or you can have your puppy shipped as freight on the airplane. Uh, And I prefer them in the order that was just listed. So if you're carrying on your pup, you have to have a soft sided crate, which are kind of the collapsible, like, not would you imagine ever seeing a Labrador in, you know, you imagine people carrying a kitten or a chihuahua or something in them, but they're soft and they have zippers and a door on that zips up on the top and on the front and they collapse. And what you have to be very careful with is each airline has a different size restriction. So okay. you need to check that before you fly, just get on their website, search for it on Google and you'll find it and make sure, you know, you're probably the best thing to do is a few weeks in advance, order that specific size on Amazon. Because if you go to a pet store, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a pet store and they had every size but the one I needed. Yep, you know, exactly. it's two inches too long, and I could spare a couple inches on the width. You know, it's just never, never the right size. So order that, pre-order it, have it with you when you go to pick your puppy up. You will need a um, document from your breeder <laughs> that shows the age of the pup, um, and I think the minimum is seven or eight weeks for carry-on, and shows like 
documentation that it's a healthy pup, but it doesn't have to be as thorough as the the technical health certificate that is required to to ship a puppy, which I'll get into in a minute. Okay. So really, you, your your breeder can actually make up the one that you need for carrying on a pup. Um, you'll need to buy some puppy pads like the ones to go to the bathroom on, because if you have a connecting flight, you're not going to be able to leave the airport and go find grass. So the best thing to do, I don't know if I should say this on on the air, but what I recommend is find the family restroom that's just a single stall unit. Mm -hmm. There'll be one in every terminal. Um, Go in there, lay down puppy pads on the whole floor, and just let the pup run around for a minute. And they'll go to the bathroom yep. and then pick it up. Do, do your diligence, you know, don't leave it in a mess. Pick it up, clean it up, uh, and then you're good to go. Um, I sent a puppy home with a buddy of mine to, uh, we flew from Memphis to San Francisco by way of Denver. And he didn't take the dog. Pup's name is Rudder. He actually was the uh, picture at the top of the page at one point yep. in time in the HP listeners group. Beautiful dog. Yeah. So Rudder was a little. Little pup, cute little pup, flew home. And Jonathan was like, "Oh, he, he slept the whole way on the first flight. You know, he's he's super chill in the airport." And he decided to just kind of leave him in his crate because he was asleep. Gets on the second flight, and like forty five minutes left, and in, in the second flight, the pup starts to to whine. The puppy's in a crate, and they just start whining just suddenly. <laughs> They've got to go. Yeah. You know, they don't just start. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you've been there the whole time. Right. Like if they're in a crate and you walk in the room and they whine, yeah, it's because they saw you, but this pup starts doing like the death scream. Oh. And man. as they're circling the runway, he just absolutely explodes in the crate. Oh. Uh, and the whole, you know, Jonathan's apologizing to everybody around him. Oh and my gosh. Like, man, I told you I sent you with puppy pads, you know, let the dog out. So highly recommend if you have a connecting flight, which most flights are going to, I mean, nowadays, Unless you're in a major city, uh, highly recommend you let them out that way. Um, and that's pretty. The only other thing you have to do is if you're carrying it on, you have to call the airline ahead and let them know because they only allow some airlines. It's two, some it's four pets in the cabin, yeah. and uh, and then you uh, will have to pay a fee. I think it's like 110 bucks or something. So not so not super bad. So, what is the reason for the soft? Soft-sided case because you can put it under your seat and just yeah to fold it or yeah they just don't do. want hard hard kennels in gotcha. there. So uh, the other way is to ship your puppy, and you can do this with uh, most airlines. We usually use Delta United if we have to. Um, the biggest thing here, like right now, I have a pup. the The one that doesn't go home with you is going to be going to Montana to Bozeman. And we've tried twice now to get the pup there, and we can't get the pup there because of temperatures. So, yeah, I mean, we could leave Memphis early in the morning, but it's going to have to connect in Minneapolis or in Detroit. And both of those have been above 85 at all the possible connecting times. So, pup's stuck here until we have a cool front come through. So, that can be an issue in both wintertime and summertime, just for the dog's safety. Yeah. Uh, When you do ship a pet, it'll cost a, a little bit, you know, you're, you know, Flying with a pup is not cheap. You have to buy a plane ticket for yourself, uh, but shipping isn't either. Usually, it's between three hundred fifty and five hundred bucks, depending on what you do. <laughs> and um, the uh, you know the temperature is an issue. You have to have a vet issued. Um, there's an a national and international. You have to have the national health certificate, and it has to be issued within ten days of the flight. So mm. they'll give you an official copy. I mean, it's like got a, a number and all that on it. That and so is that way you, you go and get that? Yeah. Whenever I take my pups to the vet, uh, they're about seven weeks old, the week before they go home. And uh, we know which ones have to ship. And so we go ahead and get the health certificate. But if I can't get this pup out by Tuesday, I'm going to have to go get another one because it expires. And that's from the temperature. Yeah. If I can't so, get it out, yeah. So, <laughs> well, what does that cost you to keep going back to the vet to get the... Uh, what it cost me and what it would cost most people would be different. A little I, different. I spend you a little a lot bit of, of money at the van. Yeah, I've got 30 do. Labradors, so I went to the vet <laughs> quite a bit. And every, I, I used to do my own shots, but I thought, you know, if I'm buying a puppy, I really like the peace of mind of, of knowing that they were seen by a veterinarian. Right. So all of our litters go to the vet before they go home so that we can send everyone home with a, a piece of paper from the vet that says, hey, here's what we checked. We checked ears. We checked bites. We listened to their hearts for murmurs. We checked lungs. We checked their joints to be sure everything sounded good, felt good. We know hernias, you know, cleaned 
dewormed, gave them their shot. All of it was done by a licensed veterinarian. Right. So I like the peace of mind of doing yeah. that. So Yeah, that's nice to... I'm sure it, it helps out. So one thing that was interesting, you know, um, we were talking to Mo, and I know we're going to record later with her so we can talk to her, but she's super worried about flying with this dog. And he kind of put her to, to ease and said, you know, the, the pressures from flying are going to make them yeah. really tired. Yeah. So, and that it's was unbelievable. That with, is that with all dogs or just puppies? I don't know. I just, I, I only know with puppies. Um, I've flown pups to Bozeman. I've flown pups all across the country for clients. And I've never had a pup stay awake on an airplane. Yeah. I mean, they just, I, I was worried the first time. I was like, I can't wake the pup up. And it's something about the pressurized cabin that just puts them out. And I mean, out, like they wake up, like they have no clue what's going on. <laughs> And uh, it's the same for all the dogs, you know, the puppies that we bring over internationally. They've made it, you know, f- from England to Atlanta. It's an eight-hour flight, and I've never had one poop in the crate. Oh. And I think it's because they've – well, my shipper over there handles everything. He don't, you know, he doesn't feed them right before they go. Right. But I think it's also because they sleep the whole way. And because uh, they definitely have some energy when they land. And how long are those – how long are those trips? Well, it's a it's a it's a chunk. It's eight hours in the air. Eight hours in the air. Plus, you know, they're usually in the crate for two hours before. Then they'll let them out maybe real quick, and then eight hour flight, and then you got to get to the terminal. And I guess knows? one other question: Would they people that you're sending dogs to? Um, are they buying a crate, and you're taking that the yeah. dog in the crate? Yeah. So okay. I just when I when I invoice for shipping, I invoice one time for the. Cargo charge, the veterinary certificate, my trip to Memphis Airport, and the crate. Gotcha. And they keep the crate, which is good because I always buy the size that's appropriate. So they can just go ahead and start crate training. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So. Good stuff. Okay. And you'll so have to go. Last thing, you'll have to go pick your dog up, you know. So you're going to have to go <laughs> get your dog um, from the airport and... Um, you know, you're going to have to either go find the cargo facility or you're going to have to go to, uh, like in Memphis, if you ship with Delta, you go to cargo facility. If you ship with United, you go to the place where you would um, go, like if you lost your bag, which is next to baggage claim. And, uh, you know, you'll need a license and uh, the license has to have an address that matches the address on the health certificate. There's just a lot of like little things mm. you have to really, you know, if you're shipping a puppy or your breeder shipping a puppy, just be sure all your T's are crossed and I's are, I's are dotted. Yeah. And that's good. You don't want anyone stealing your dog. No, no, it's a good thing. And especially when you see, you know, hey, if you're uh, if you're flying with United Airlines, you know, don't don't let them make you put your pet in the overhead bin. You know, mm. I mean, that stuff is wild, and you think that'll never happen to me. But you know, just be diligent and be wise, and make sure you keep an eye on your pup. There's way too many videos going around of people getting on fight. Do you see the the last one that there's a uh, a husband and a wife, and I believe that they both were deaf, and they yeah, had and a, someone punched their Great Dane. Yeah, yeah, and that guy just well, they was lost not it. Not having yeah. it. I think everyone was a little bit in the wrong there. I think it, got, it escalated yeah. quite quickly. Yeah, he wouldn't let yeah. him off the. Well, you know, they shipped that one guy's uh, dog to China. United Airlines did. It was supposed to land in Kansas, like Topeka or something like that, or Kansas City, and it ended up in China. Sure. And uh, boy, as a guy who I've imported. A lot of Labradors from the United Kingdom. And boy, if, if I found out one of these dogs went to China, oh, man, uh, that would be nuts. You know, Shanghai. Just, yeah, not good. Where's where's my lab? Where's my new stud dog? Oh, oh. yeah. No good. <laughs> not good at all. I think he's running around North Korea. No. So, okay, so what, what additional things do you have to do um, for international flying or shipping? Yeah, if you're shipping, you have to do an international health certificate, which is a bigger deal. A little, few more questions. It depends on where you're going, um, and it depends on the age of the dog. So rabies is a weird deal. In, in America, we are not rabies-free, and we don't do rabies vaccinations until 16 weeks, which is pretty much common around the world. So like, if I were to ship a pup to Canada, which I have done, uh, they have to be at least, I want to say it's 10 or 12 weeks for Canada and they don't have to have a rabies vaccination because of their age, but they have to have a veterinarian sign off saying they're too young for the rabies vaccination. And that's why they don't have it. 
Makes but sense. But your vet will have, if it's a reputable vet, they'll have all the info you need to do that. But the best thing you can do is go to this specific airline's website and look at the their rules for shipping a dog internationally. And most airlines, honestly, will make you go through um, a certified international pet shipper, which those people, you can find them, they'll recommend them for you, and those folks will handle all your details. Nice. Nice. Um, it's it's not that hard. I don't do a lot of exporting of dogs. I have sent a lot of dogs to Canada. Um, I've sent a few, uh, you know, other places. Sent one to Austria, one to England. But most of what I do is bring them over. So, are there? I guess I don't. I've never done it. But like, if you drove from Montana into Canada, do you have to have paperwork on a mm-hmm. dog? Yeah, you have, to, you have to have veterinary paperwork. Even if you're going on a hunt trip and you yep. leave from here. Yep. So if you're taking your dog hunting in Canada, which a lot of you guys listening probably will either have done or will do, um, then you will need to have a um, – it's not a, an official certificate. Basically, your vet will just need to show that your inoculation, like your parvo distemper – uh, I think I want to say Bordetella lepto and ra- rabies is the huge one – are up to date. And they have a rule. I can't remember what it is. I want to say it's like within the last five months or something like that, six months. Like they have to be so pretty fairly, recent. Fairly yeah. recent. <laughs> yeah. Best thing is to plan a visit to the vet the month before you go to Canada. Yeah. I guess I never thought of that. That's good stuff. Yeah. It's all right. Good. Um, all right. Well, let's go forward to just some equipment that you use. You know, pull in last night and go past some of the. All your pretty girls out there, and then a shed full of <laughs> goodies, and and then yeah. and then your boys are right there too. So, um, I guess from let's start at just a young age, and kind of what kind of equipment you use for for training, and even you know from place mats to yeah, if people make their own or you know we can yeah. just yep, run. Yep. It. Yeah, the sky's the limit. Yeah, it's sort of like waterfowling. Everyone feels the same, like. Whenever you think to yourself, I finally bought enough stuff, something comes out or you see something and you're like, oh, man, I need that, yep. you know, or second made a jacket that's a lot like the other one I have, but it's newer and I want it. And, and the decoys have yep. flocked everything now and I want them. You know, it's just that's what we do. It's so, a rabbit hole. Yeah. Dog training is very much the same. There's always new trinkets coming out and they're super helpful. But as far as what you really need, you need some. I like canvas dummies, dummies that are made of some sort of soft material. Like uh, I would highly recommend the ones made by Real Duck, uh, which are fire hose with uh, cork inside. So they feel more like a real bird. They're, mm. not, they're not super soft and squishy, which encourages chewing, and they're not hard. Um, you do probably want some rubber dummies uh, or plastic dummies, a lot of people call them. Uh, they're made, there's a lot of different ones out there on Gun Dog Supply, and they're cheap. They're like two bucks, three bucks. And that's really helpful to have for like pile work, um, you know, casting work and that sort of thing. You're going to want some docking uh, dead foul dummies for your water work, just for water marks, because the other stuff will get, the canvas ones will get wet and over time get waterlogged. And uh, <laughs> the dockins are actually really helpful. I'll give a plug for those guys. Um, they've never done anything for me, but I'll give a plug, except they've helped me in training a good bit. Uh, when a dog shakes with a dock in its mouth, that, that really hard plastic head, will smack the dog on the head. So mm-hmm. that's actually there to encourage a dog not to shake with a duck on its mouth. Nice. And I've seen that thing work time and time again. I really like the teal, the teal size. So you can fit a bunch of them in your bag. Um, and you're gonna then you need... do that for full-size dogs too? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We use it for full-size well, dogs I mean for the, the teal. You like the teal across the board? Yeah. For I, like, I like that. We have the mallard and the teal. We have like okay. five or six mallards and eight or nine teal. Gotcha. Um, but... We, we like them both. You know, we're young dogs. The mallard is nice because it's a big old thing floating out in the water like, oh, there right. it is, you know, but <laughs> you can hide those teal pretty well. Right. And uh, the goose is pretty – if you hunt geese, I actually do recommend getting – if you hunt big honkers, that one of their geese, they make a snow goose and they make a Canada goose and they're like 12 pounds. And so, they're super helpful for teaching dogs how to haul in something big, Yeah, you know, which is good. Uh, a lot more about drive than it is size. We can talk about that another time. Um and so for that's it for dummies. You need a good slip lead. Um, you can use a choke chain. I prefer a standard slip lead. I would never train with a just a flat collar and a leash hooked to it. Always a slip lead. 
Um, if you're using Cornerstone, you'll need a clicker and a little pouch to keep some treats in. You'll phase that out pretty early. I want to say by six, eight months, my dogs are completely off of a clicker unless I need to revisit something. But for puppies, it's good to have a nice clicker and some treats if you want to train with the style that we use, uh, which I found to be super effective. Um, and then from there, it's all about how much you want to spend. You know, you've got your dummies. You can walk and put stuff out. You can have someone throw for you or you can buy a remote launcher. You know, we have uh, three or four Versa launchers at SOK and those are made by a retriever trainer and they're fantastic. Uh, we have some duds. You know, we have some issues with them misfiring sometimes, but I think everything has that. Um, you can buy a Thunder launcher. You can buy wingers. If you're going to run hunt tests, we highly suggest that you get wingers. All of our hunt test trainers use wingers. You could buy Singer Winger or Gunner Up. There's a bunch of companies that make those. And those are the things where you can put a uh, like a docken or a dummy or a duck into it and push a button from far away and it will fling it out into the air and mm-hmm. you get to run marks off of that. And the benefit there is you can use real ducks, whereas with a dummy launcher, you have to use dummies. Yeah. Um, that stuff is not necessary, but it is helpful. Uh, unless you have someone who can throw for you. A starter pistol is nice, but to be honest, you can order the 22 blanks uh, in a 12-gauge car- gauge cartridge and use your duck hunting shotgun. So you don't have to have a starter pistol. Nice. Um, they sell those at Gundog Supply. And uh, you can buy the ones that sound like a 22, and you can buy the ones that are just 12-gauge blanks, and those sound like a 12-gauge. So be careful which ones you buy. You know, if you're working with a puppy and you slide one of the other blanks in there and it's going to, you know, you're not going to have any kick, but it's going to sound like a 12-gauge. Yeah. And so you're going to want to, yeah, definitely pay attention to which ones you get. (laughs) Oh, and a whistle. Yeah, you need a whistle, whistle lanyard. Talk to your trainer or people around you or people you're going to train with to figure out what kind of whistle you want. We use the oblong whistles, the Acme, which is a higher pitch, and some people use the big, you know, whistles with the horn on it that you can hear from about three counties over. Uh, I like the softer whistles that, you know, you can hear them up to four or 500 yards, but you're not going to really disturb birds with them. Right. So how about uh, like a place, a place board? Um, yeah. Do you recommend buying one? Do you recommend building one or just having a specific spot Either or, one? you know, I really like, it's really easy to build them with two by fours and that little, uh, that little carpet, the like decking carpet you can buy at, uh, yeah. You can buy it at uh, like Lowe's. Yeah. Um, they're super simple. Two by fours, plywood. Usually recommend about 20 by 20 inches. Two feet by two feet is fine, but it's a little big because the dog can turn around a whole lot and move from one side to the other. I like them to kind of be stuck. You know, here's where you are. Right there. Um, Momarsh makes a thing called a kennel cot, and it's made to go inside a large kennel and uh, keep the dog elevated. So when the dog's wet, the water will drain off the dog below the kennel cot so when you drive home from the duck blind the dog stays warm you know not sitting in water yeah super super great product but we use them for place boards you know all the time so kennel cot's really nice um and then beyond that when you're actually training using dog stands (laughs) um i highly recommend momarsh products for dog stands i mean they're invisalab we have the new um I want to say it's the field blind, field cot. I can't remember what it's called. Um, they'll be out this fall. And uh, man, I love that thing. It's fantastic. Nice. Um, yeah, they seem to be uh, run, running away with the Yeah, Ira makes a product. nice product. He's super easy to work with. Their customer service is second to none. Um, something breaks, they'll get you taken care of super quickly. Um, they have a, a final stand, which is just sort of their dog stand, which is if you're hunting in water, it's very important that you can keep your dog out of that water. Right. And so the final stand is good. And then the Invisa lab is the final stand with a blind attached to it. And, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. It seems to be pretty popular in, in your group there. A lot of guys, you know, they'll post up pictures and have yeah showing that and just, it's just a really, really nice and you know, people ask, you know, what kind of stand should I get? And it's Momarsh every time. Yeah, I mean, know, everyone used to get the Avery stands, and there's nothing wrong with them theoretically, but they shake really badly because yeah. the legs are connected. So the two legs and two legs are connected in the middle. So when a dog gets up there and moves, it starts to wobble. Yeah. And the dog will get, I used to call the speed wobbles, and they sit there and wobble faster and faster until they had to jump <laughs> off. And and uh, you don't want that. So the Momarshes have been really nice. Now, as far as <clears throat> if you want to buy... If you want to train with stuff that you're going to see in the field, which I highly recommend, you know, take things out in the field with you, like uh, a, a call, 
you know, blow a call before it marks a run. Yeah. Um, get a field blind. You can use the Momarsh one that I mentioned. Uh, Riggle Wright makes a really nice field blind. It's a triangular shape and it folds up really small. And uh, we've used one for like four seasons in a row without a single problem. Those look really nice as far as shadows are concerned yeah. as well. Yeah, they're not as big you know, and squared you don't have up. A big square, right. Man, I'm just, you know, we're we're heading back tomorrow. I'm just thinking about this drive and other things that, um, you know, that we're going to run into. Because I know, you know, I'm sitting here in your living room and looking at Van Camp, and I know he's going to want to stop and get some more barbecue and right uh, <laughs> yeah leave the car running with the pup in there you know don't if it's hot you know and you can park where you can see the car and just let them hang out i guess another thing we can talk about um you know there's a lot of people that i don't know how many how many have made a comment lately about going and training and i don't know what they're exactly using if it's blanks or the the launchers, whatever they're using, but the cops end up getting called because people think that they're hunting yeah. in the summertime. <laughs> Chad that, Duckworth. Was that Chad? Chad was using launchers out in the park, and somebody said he was using an AR-15, man. SWAT rolled in, everything. The SWAT came, came up out, guns drawn. Oh, man. So that's, uh, you know, definitely, I guess if there's someone that you're able to contact before you go training there to get permission to make sure, or I guess even calling the police station and letting them know. Yep. Probably let them know. Call someone, just let them know, here's what I'm doing. We've, we've run into this a few times, and, you know, the best thing, first of all, you need to be sure you're aware of the leech laws. Um, because if there is a leech law, you're there, you know, they can give you some trouble for training. Yeah. Um, but... The few times I've encountered issues, we've actually had the police come and watch what we're doing. We've actually had them come to our house <laughs> because <laughs> Mark Helios, we had, we had a launcher that wasn't working. And Mark was like, oh, I'm going to fix it. So he did. And he went out in the driveway and just started like rapid firing the launcher. And the guys at the car wash were like, he's shooting at somebody. And so the car wash is down oh, the street. Geez. And so cops came rolling in hot. And then they stuck around and they watched what we were doing and they were super pumped about it. And that's happened to me at a public park before. That happened to Chad Duckworth. They were actually really impressed with his dog and what he was doing. So just be cool about it and show them what you're doing and show them every single thing you have that makes a boom and how nothing can be shot from it that would hurt anyone. And <laughs> should be good. You know, just be respectful and uh, don't, should be fine. Don't aim the launchers at, at your friends. I guess Another thing that I saw that I was wondering about um, – and I forget where it was. I don't know if it was in our group or uh, maybe the Southern Southern Oak Kennel Society. But there's someone that was training their dog, and they had I don't know if it was like a 20 foot lead, but they sent him out into a lake or into a river, and that lead was dragging behind him. Yeah, not good. Yeah, not a fan. And I was like, Ugh. like I can understand if you're working on land and trying to trying to use it that way or letting them go out into the water, especially where I'm at. Like you're going over way too much driftwood and yeah. stuff to get locked up and you lose <laughs> yeah. your dog real quick. Yeah. I would never want to send a dog out on a field retrieve with a lead on or even a, a choke collar. You know, some guys will buy the leads that we sell at SOK and uh, has a choke collar on it. And there's some great guys that'll leave that choke collar on, you know, pretty much permanently. And I know of a guy who was shipping a finished dog uh, from England across to America and they left a choke collar on the dog and um, f for the <laughs> part of the ride was in a truck and a kennel and when they got there and opened the kennel the dog was dead choke collar had gotten wrapped up in the food bowl dog went into panic mode choked himself and uh, man oh that could gosh. happen in the field so easily and could be a very dangerous moment <laughs> whether it's timber or a river or wherever it whatever is whatever it is there's opportunities for them to get caught and so I think, you know, it is, it's nice out. It's still, uh, the sun's up. I think we're going to get into a little bit of training Heck yeah. here tonight and then probably record again and, uh, maybe get some stories from Canada from Mr. Aaron Hitchens and, and do a little conversation there, but we're about 40, 43 minutes in on this one. It was a pretty, pretty good conversation. Definitely, uh. Excited to get this puppy back and, yeah. and play with her. I guess I'm excited to pick her out, even though it's you know my father-in-law's dog. But I guess is is there anything else that you would? How about food? Okay, so say we're in the car for 19 hours tomorrow. Would you feed 
When would you feed the dog? Would yeah, you feed so the dog my tomorrow? dogs are on a two-a-day schedule right now just to simplify things. And so they eat morning and evening. I would feed. Um, and it's okay to skip a, a meal with a puppy. They're not going to starve. Right. They'll be fine. They'll be hungry, probably a little hangry, but you're not going to hurt them. <laughs> so if you're leaving first thing in the morning, I probably would um, not feed then. I would drive on and then probably feed, you know, you could either feed mid-morning when you know you're going to have time to stop. The thing about pups is when they eat, they're going to have to go to the bathroom. Right. So um, the pup may decide because it's traveling and doesn't want to eat at all. And then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but, they just get weirded out. Yeah. <clears throat> but as a rule, they need to eat every, you know, 8 to 12 hours. And that's helpful. If you need to skip one of those, that's fine. I would definitely not go longer than, you know, 18 hours without a pup eating. Um, just know that when you feed them, you're going to have to stop. So <laughs> is there, is there happen. a time that you said with water, it's 10 to 20 minutes before you're going to stop? Yeah. Pups are different. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, they'll eat and they poop within two minutes and sometimes <laughs> it's 30 or 40. <laughs> so so and just, it's hard to tell. I have to get to know. But I can tell you, they'll get a little restless in the vehicle. I'd highly recommend having puppy pads and paper towels and like some, you know, some yeah. sort of spray. Just in case. Great. <laughs> Best of luck to you. you know. <laughs> Usually it happens at the crate. You don't realize that they later. start scratching and then right. all of a sudden every one of the cars starts to smell something and oh boy. Oh, Vina camps over there. That's that's his duty riding back. Puppy poo duty. <laughs> Puppy poo duty. No, so, well, um, I think it's pretty good. Pretty good combo. We're going to go play with some dogs and let the puppies out again. Finally pick one out here and... Um, chat again here shortly so i hope you guys enjoyed that and got a little info on car travel plane travel and some equipment ideas if you are getting a dog and things to think about that are an additional cost that you might not have thought about before so i hope you liked it see you later thanks barton yeah thanks for having me all right well i think you did okay there for your second run um first in person not too bad, Dan. Nice work. I think uh, probably the first thing we should say is, you know, we appreciate uh, Barton and Southern Oak Kennels, not for the, not just for their support of the show, but for allowing you know you to come down there and, and do some recording with them on site and everything like that. So appreciate Barton. And uh, he's been a really good friend of the show for quite a while now. So uh, appreciate that. And how uh, how was the trip home? I mean, did you guys follow all the protocol? Did you have any issues in the cab? Did Vandekamp have to do any puppy poop cleanup? What uh, how did it work out? No, it went it went really well, and um, we did follow protocol, and we found some uh, large hospitals that we could let the puppy out on the front lawn, like football field sized lawns, and uh, a couple churches we stopped at, and really there was no. I asked Barton about feeding and how long he would go before feeding. And he said about he wouldn't go over 18 hours of not feeding them because they're on about a two-a-day feeding schedule. So um, we did water, and it, like you said, about 10 to 20 minutes after you give them water, they'll have to go out, and that was about spot on. And then the food, I fed her in Morgantown, and it was probably about two hours from there that she had to get let out. And that's the only time that she whined um, about anything. Like, just a great traveling dog. It was it was super easy. There was no, no poop cleanup or pee cleanup. Um, I think it was just a really, really good trip. I don't think it could have went any better. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, when I bought my dog several years ago now, I mean, we were coming home. And it was like maybe a two hour drive total and he dropped a deuce in the truck. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he fared much better than I did. <laughs> yeah. I actually couldn't believe it. I'm like, is she still alive? Like, yeah, she's sleeping. I'm like, all right, she's still alive. Yeah. Well, she's laying there looking at us and it's hmm. funny. And even, you know, that was a, a week ago and she's already a lot faster and, um, it just it's cool to watch puppies grow it's like you know yeah so i'm interested in, the, in speed. i'm interested in what the plan is for this dog because you know it's your father-in-law's dog i don't mm -hmm. i don't think he waterfowl hunts that i know of so he is, he used to waterfowl hunt like a maniac and he wants to get back into it <clears throat> oh, so okay. i think we'll be trying some uh 
probably A-frame blinds, whatnot, whenever the pup's ready. And and I think he really, now that he's retired and his pup passed away um, last fall, you know, looking for a companion and and enjoys the training and, and everything like that. So he wants to get her ready. Worst case scenario, I'll have to take her out by myself with my friends. Dang. But no, but no, he's, uh, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if Kimber, I don't know if Kimber's going to like that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Kimber, you know, she just turned nine and I think, you know, by the time Boo's ready, she won't be ready this fall. I don't think, I don't think I'd take her out that early. Yeah. <clears throat> so now you know, is he, next year, is he, is he planning to do uh cornerstone gun dog Academy? Yep. He's fallen cornerstone already. Been nice. Been checking that out. And, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of, yeah, when I trained my last dog, I didn't do this. I did more like this and I have to correct him quite a bit, but you know, he's, he's staying steady with the crate training and, uh, and doing well. So I'm, cool. I'm hopeful, hopeful yeah. for Boo. Well, that'll be exciting to, uh, follow along as the dog progresses and see how, uh, how she does. I have no doubt she'll, uh, she'll do great. Yeah. So those I tell you what, well, just one more thing about Barton's operation down there. Um it's incredible to watch. It's almost like a magic show when he even when he lets the dogs out to run and play, like he'll walk down the whole kennel, open up every gate and stand back and they're all just sitting there. And he calls them out one by one and they come and sit right next to him. I mean, what he does works and it's if you haven't checked out Cornerstone, you need to check it out. If you haven't checked out Southern Oak Kennels, you need to check them out. And uh, I just, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing to watch. Really, really cool. That was all. Cool. Well, anything else that you want to add before we uh, wrap up this week's show? Uh, I don't think so, man. You know, it's finally getting nice summertime. Been doing a lot of mowing of the yard which is kind of my happy can't time. believe we've lasted this long without a weather plug <laughs> that's impressive it's been a been a minute do you want to no. do you want do you want to get your weekly uh 100th episode tease in right now well i kind of i i got my fill on the instagram post that transferred over facebook so i'm kind of good but still yes you need to follow us 100th episode coming up it's gonna be epic yeah definitely um if you guys aren't following us on instagram definitely head over there and check that out uh, hp outdoors on instagram we need a little bump on our our followers over there we're starting to put a little more um material over there so definitely if you're not following us over there check us out there and also right now if you're not in our listeners group on facebook go check it out we have a little sitka giveaway going you might be a, a winner of a jacket. Yep, Check giving it away out. a Sitka Enjoy. Hudson jacket currently, right? Yeah, that group's awesome. Yeah, so get over get there in. if you're not in it. Get in, see what it takes to get in that giveaway. That's the thing about our group. We do we do a lot more giveaways exclusively to that group than um, you know we do on some of other stuff. So if you want to get in on on all that action, get over to our Facebook listeners group and check us out. Uh, I know. A couple guys have hit me up and they said, you know, cause we are, we do kind of try to filter it, uh, so that we don't get, you know, terrorists and spam and, and stuff in the listeners group. So some people have, have messaged me because they're not on Facebook and they want to get in the group and they're afraid that if they just create a profile, that's kind of generic, that's just for them to get into the group to like chat with us, um, that they're afraid that we're not going to let them in. So if you have that concern, uh, just shoot us a, uh, an email or, um, uh, you know, a message on another platform, Twitter, or Instagram, or whatever, just shoot us a message and let us know what you, what screen name you're going to use or whatever. And we'll let you in. But you know, if you don't let us know who you are and it looks like a very generic profile, but we're probably not going to approve that. So, um, just give us a heads up and we'll let you in. No problem. <clears throat> Get in there and, uh, check out all the stuff in there that's going on. So all right. I have, uh, one last thing. I got a message yesterday from Craig Rolf, R O L F E. And he said, hey, man, can you call this guy out on your podcast? And he's talking about Jacob Britton. He said, um, he's made my daughter's year with his calls he just gave me for no charge. 
He only asked that I'd paid on. He said, look at this little girl. She is deaf and loves the sound of the calls that he gave us. So his little girl um, looks like she has some a small contraption in her ear. He says that she's deaf and just goes around blowing on these calls and loves, you know, playing around on them and stuff. So that's that's the kind of community we have in our group. Good on you, Jacob Britton. Um, he's on there quite a bit, very active, and and there's a lot of guys giving calls away to kids and other people that need them. So that's super good stuff. And um, Craig, I hope your little girl enjoys that and and drives you crazy. Yep. Yep. Great job, everybody, on that one. And like you said, we see that stuff quite a bit in that group. And, uh, you know, I think that what you're seeing now, too, is that that group has sort of been kind of like the blueprint. Now you see a lot more groups kind of going towards that that style where, you know, nobody's putting up with, uh, you know, Internet tough guys in there and stuff. And we just we just move on if if people want to cause problems. And uh, it create it fosters a really good environment for guys to ask questions for new, new hunters to ask questions, um, you know, things that if you post in some groups, you would actually, you would get just completely destroyed over. Um, you know, we have uh, good open discussions and, uh, hopefully it's a place where people can learn and, uh, help everybody get, you know, a better experience in the outdoors and, and, uh, yeah, create a good community. So I feel like we've done that and hopefully we'll continue to build it. Uh, anything yes, else sir. you got here, Dan, before we, uh, wrap up this week? I mean, we're finishing up here on a Sunday morning, getting everything tied together for tomorrow's episode, and uh, have another big guest coming up here next week, so stay tuned, and um, we're counting down to that number 100, Yep, so stay with us. Yep, the 100th giveaway is going to be great, so definitely uh, follow along, make sure you're checking that out. And before we do wrap up this week, a couple of things I wanted to hit, uh, we do still have uh, HMHB Outdoor hats available on our website under the store tab so if you haven't been able to uh get over there and pick up your hat we still have some a few left so if you're interested in that check those out also uh we're going to put up a page on our website that that tracks all of the discount codes that we have active currently for the for the listeners of our show but i did want to just give a rundown really quickly um for anybody who's looking to save a little bit of cash we've got some discount codes the first one is uh 10 off your purchase with dunn sporting goods you can use the discount code HPO to get 10% off your purchase. There are some restrictions on that, uh, but for most of the things that, that you're looking to buy, it will uh, it will apply. We also have a new um, relationship with the show that you may have noticed on, on the beginning when we mentioned it, but uh, we've, we're proud to partner with uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company. You can use the discount code HP Outdoors uh, when you place your first order with them to save 15% off of your order. So, uh, if you're not familiar with Black Rifle Coffee Company, it's a veteran-owned company that does a lot of great things, has a lot of great products. So definitely check them out if you have not yet. And we do have a 10% off discount code with White Rock Decoys. It's also HP Outdoors. Um, it's all capital letters, I believe. Uh, not sure if it's case sensitive or not, but when they send it to us, it was all capital letters. So try that if you're going to use it. But we're proud to uh, partner with White Rock Decoys as well uh, with the show. So lots of great things going on here. And we will continue to pass on savings to you all as often as we possibly can. So definitely check those out. And we will create a page on our website so that you can go and track all of the current uh, discounts that we got going on. Also, <clears throat> one um, last thing. Well, you can't keep saying say. one last thing when it's not the last thing, Dan. <laughs> okay, right, maybe the last your, thing. This is your one last thing. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, 737 Duck Calls. If you want an HP edition. Give us a shout out, message us, and we'll uh, give you the discount code HPO2018. And or you could just call Dustin at the shop and get your HP edition 737 duck or goose call. Yeah, if you haven't seen those yet, check us out There's over in, on Instagram. We've got a, a bunch of pictures up there from uh, a lot of listeners that have made those that ordered those calls and they look sharp. Really, yep. really excited with, with about those and, um, you know. Really appreciative of the opportunity to partner with uh, Dustin 737 Duck Calls over there. So check those out as well. We'll put that up on the on the webpage as well. Any other one last things, Dan, before we uh, close <laughs> I'm, out? I'm out of one last things. <laughs> All right. Well, again, just to uh, reiterate, thank you to this week's, uh, the supporters of this week's show, Gunner Kennels, Off Grid Food Company, Hunt Hickory Creek, 
Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Mount Airy Waterfowl Club in Warsaw, Virginia, and Southern Oak Kennels. Uh, we say it every week, but please, you know, support the shows that support us. The, the, they've helped us build the community, and um, you know, we are we are forever grateful for uh, all the support that they've offered us towards the show. That's going to do it for this week. Hopefully you enjoyed the discussion on how to pick out that puppy, get the gear that you need to get it home safely, and uh, start that training process off on the right foot. As we mentioned before, if you're new to the show, check out all the past episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast content. We love I st- uh, iTunes ratings, five-star ratings and reviews. If you haven't had a chance to go over there, uh, get that squared away. Get in our Facebook listeners group. Find out how you can win a Sitka Hudson jacket. So until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care.